You don't get to do lovely gardens for your very wealthy residents and not provide something down the line because they've got to stop seeing it as a, a sort of thing they have to do and they don't really want to do because actually it makes society better because it makes society healthier and healthier and happier people make healthier and happier neighbourhoods which a private developer should actually welcome and want. Hello everyone and welcome to Future Rex, a podcast by Martin Hearn, event director of Future Build and co-host Dr Oliver Jones, research director at Rider Architecture. Future X will bring together some of the brightest minds and some of the most disruptive thinkers and innovators to transform the construction industry and build a Future X community of like-minded people that can begin to make a real change. We really hope you enjoy the series. Hello and welcome to another episode of Future X. I'm Martin Hearn, event director at Future Build, and once again privileged to be joined by my co-host Dr. Oliver Jones at Rider Architecture. Oliver fascinating guest this week oh mate tell me about it i mean i feel like you need to unleash the name on the people listening right away just so they can prepare their minds for the sheer madness that they're about to encounter it's glorious madness it's insanely intelligent in fact it's genius at times but who we're talking to well i think we can definitely say she's a character it's mac gilchrist and now those that don't know who she is she works for an absolutely fascinating company called the Edible Bus Stop. It's quite hard to actually explain what they are, but they do everything from guerrilla landscaping to huge community projects, really bringing the green into uh, urban environments. And you guys have had quite a bit of experience with Mac and the Edible Bus Stop over the years, haven't you? We did, we did. Uh, one year they put a yellow line right the way through our show and showcased some of their quite sort of stop and look street furniture and then the year after that they came and brought a whole pocket park to the show called the hive and actually we donated that to a local project near our old office in london bridge and um, every time i walk past i still see it. it brings a smile to my face nice nice and it's still going i guess i was really excited to to speak to mac because I'd seen the work that she'd done with you guys in the past, but also like Mac kind of embodies just what a disruptor is for me. She's like totally out there, existing in a world that even by her own admission, she says that she probably shouldn't exist in. And she's making waves, she's changing things, and she's getting some amazing projects over the line just because she's incredibly talented and really passionate about change and transformation that improves people's lives with nature and green infrastructure absolutely and she just embodies that can-do attitude and not being afraid to question the norm or just make a change as well so let's get mac on mac it's fantastic to finally get you on the podcast thank you so much for coming on today hello thank you for having me We've obviously collaborated many times in the past at Future Build, and you've done some fascinating, disruptive uh, landscaping at the event. But I think I'd almost like to ask you, how did it all start? How did it begin? I have got a very unusual entry into this world. I've stumbled uphill. It started life as actually seeing a planning notice on a lamppost and seeing that a local piece of land, public land, was going to get possibly sold off to private developers and feeling quite strongly about a very mature silver maple not being cut down and also it isn't much of it's not much happening there but it's still public lands and I felt really strongly about we need this space we need access to green space now at the time back in 2011 I did not have any of the language available to me now I came from the fashion business I just knew in my gut not on my turf, not without me kicking up a fuss about this. I also knew that no one's just going to listen to me, so I better actually get um, my feelers out as to what the neighbourhood thinks. And that involved knocking on neighbours, immediate neighbours' doors, and fly posting about 500 letterboxes locally, asking that question and providing an email for responses. Yes, so eventually we started life by guerrilla gardening that patch of land. A meeting in the pub when we were we were asking people who'd come in for this, what do you want to do with this space of land? There was all sorts of 
different answers and eventually I said has anyone noticed that little gorilla garden <laughs> vegetable patch someone's put there in the past couple of years and without fail everyone in the pub answered with a big smile on their face yes so I was like right well we're going to plant edibles then because it's a relationship we all have we all eat and so from the get-go I was very attracted to putting edibles in schemes because it's something that we personally can relate to and it has that added advantage of seasonality. You're not going to get your strawberries in January. They are going to turn up in summer, which is also quite important for us to remember. And it just so happened to be next to a bus stop. So that's how I got the name Edible Bus Stop. <laughs> so let's go back a little. First off, how? You know, this is the levels of sort of collaboration and knowledge needed. And, you know, how just to say we're going to do this and then we're just going to go and do it. You know, that's that's pretty amazing. So what like what were the challenges that you faced at the time? You know, there must have been quite a lot of uphill battling to get people together and almost a bit of a forerunner for collaborative co-design and community design of a space. Absolutely. I think one of the advantages is I had no idea. I was clueless as to what faced me. So I just did it. I think I probably would be a bit more reticent now because I know I've got 11 years of experience. But to imply that I did this by myself would be completely wrong. Obviously, the initial neighbours' doors that I knocked on were very responsive, including my then next door neighbour, who happened to be a member of a political party who happened to have ward councillors. He said, I'll have a word with him about this. I'll let him know that you're about to go around the neighbourhood and ask. I was like, Why me? No, it's you. You're going to do this, she said. So I had that encouragement. My then partner was very up for it. Other neighbours were very up for it. Friends were up for it. And in fact, one friend came along and said, this is great. You know, I know a landscape architect who this is really right up his strassa. And so about two months into us manning all of this, enter stage left my former business partner, Will Sandy, who then helped form and flesh out the ideas so whilst the concept came from me I cannot stake a claim on being the sole proprietor that would be immediately very unfair because you do rely on support in the community or or feedback whatever and eventually for instance that first garden has now been taken on by the community and I no longer have anything to do with it because they have to have ownership over it now Maybe you want to tell people about Waterloo Bridge and give us a bit of a run into that. So having having got this garden going locally, we were very fortunate that the head of highways in Lambeth was a very keen gardener. We were also very fortunate that he was actually quite a visionary and he could see that we were onto something and that we were really motivated. When I say we, that by now it's Will and I, the edible bus stop design consultancy. And we've been asked by another neighbourhood about three miles down the road, could you do this for us too? Just so happened to be on the same bus route as our bus route. So we then <laughs> developed the idea of an edible bus route and how other communities could join in and share resources. That was the original plan. Hasn't quite worked out that way, but that's how it carried on developing. And I didn't realise that you needed particular skills to write grant applications. So I just wrote a grant application to the then Mayor in London's Pocket Park programme, which was successful. So all of a sudden, loads of money came in, not to us, mind you, to Lambeth, because Lambeth were our partners in it. So, yeah, so it just sort of kept on going, snowballing from there, falling uphill, cut to eventually mutual friends coming to me and saying there's an organization extinction rebellion yeah yes i've heard i know the people i know some key people involved yeah the same thing is we want to do an action an action what do you mean by that says i completely naive at that stage as to what it was and yeah and so i then meet with them i was there on one of the very first actions they have naturally my sympathies and somehow along the way, I was appointed art director of Waterloo Bridge in the April 2019 uh, lockdown of London, if you like, the XR lockdown of London, central London. And 
before I knew it, there I am sourcing trees, which I felt very strongly should burst into blossom on the bridge. So that was quite challenging to select those trees. I went to Barchams, who I may say had no idea, no idea what I was buying for at the time. <laughs> They kept on looking at me going, but what do you mean a very exposed site? <laughs> I was like, I can't tell you anything, can't tell you anything. <laughs> and so they, yeah, so we chose each tree individually. And I remember coming back from that particular procurement operation, noticing that I'd chosen 47 trees, which I couldn't quite account for what this rather strange number. And it was actually only once on the bridge, which is wonderful that we got them on there. And there's a whole story around stopping the van and me screaming, get the trees on the bridge. And then coming along like ants onto the bridge with all these volunteers that had just miraculously appeared that I didn't know about. Again, they just all there, ready to help. And uh, before we knew it, we had all these trees there. And I'm being told that, yeah, you do realise that 47 trees is exactly the amount of trees that were planted by the suffragettes in their arboretum. I was like, really? That's interesting. 47? Yeah, and actually you've got a couple of the species here. You know, the only one that's left, because they were cut down for a housing development in the 60s, is uh, Pinus nigra, that one there. It's like, Really? So now my, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck are starting to stand up about that particular story. And then, of course, finally somebody went, well, you know what Waterloo Bridge is, don't you? Oh, my God, it's the women's bridge. It was built by women. Oh, my God. <laughs> so there you go. There's a lovely story there. Again, so it's actually a perfect example of falling uphill. Nothing was planned. Mm. Look to me. I'm quite open to consider things that maybe others wouldn't. I'll give it a go. And as I said at the beginning, it's possibly because I'm naive as exactly what I've just taken on. But I like the concept and I want to help. So I'll come on board. Mac, we've worked together in the past and I've seen a lot of your work. And it's obvious what you're talking about at the moment around that community engagement, the need to disrupt the aspect of theatre really to your work as well and activism. And that's so true to who you are as a person. Has that been difficult keeping that as your work got more and more commercial or you had commercial partners on board? How do you think that status quo? You really nailed it on the head there because it is um, challenging at times. Theatre, that's a lovely word. Thank you for using that. I'm constantly going back to it, how I can return to that theatrical element mm. where there's an entertainment value, where it isn't just landscape architecture or landscape I'm not a landscape architect although I work in landscape in the public realm and so I tend to steer towards projects that are quirky in that way and so when working on I'm working on a scheme at the moment and essentially I've been brought in to see what I could do to enhance the existing scheme because it's not quite met what the stakeholders were hoping for. So I'll be brought in to add theatre. So I'm kind of trying carving that niche out because that's really my, my area of speciality and it's where I feel the most passion for. And I, and I think we've seen it, some of your sort of urban greening projects, not just your pocket parks, but the work you did with TfL as well in their disused ticket offices is mm -hmm. it's those stop and stare moments isn't it that you walk past something and yeah. for me that's always been your signature yeah yeah the tiny parks on the london underground are extraordinarily popular um and who'd have thunk it it's you know let, let's just break it down if i wasn't mean being mean about me she's bummed a couple of house plants <laughs> put some mirrors around there you know uh it's so much more than that it's again it's how people relate to things what 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 triggers what is triggered when they see these things mm. why do people love the tiny parks yeah. they're a little bit of magical mystery like like you as pointed out martin why on earth is that there you know something theatrical then there's oh i recognize that plant oh hang on mm, yeah that's inspiring then there's 
oh, that feels really nice to be able to look at that. The biophilic element. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's actually not, I think that's probably more subconscious. And then on the occasions that I'm in there, because I'll do some maintenance and some replant, you know, some refills and freshening up of them every so often. There's the fact that people walk past, see them, you give them a wave, but without fail, children walk past and just sort of stand there and look and come up and want to look in there. It's I can see how in particular the child's eye responds very well to it. And I've actually witnessed the child trying to, mommy, 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 you'll never guess what I just saw. And that carrying through. And this child with me just waving, going, Shh, your secret. <laughs> But yes, they are. There is that sort of connection that they give on many levels. The tiny parks, uh, yeah, I'd be willing for an academic to try and figure out why they're so popular. Uh, yeah, we've talked about it. We've talked about the nature of disruptors and being disruptive in an existing establishment. What are your views of that sort of typical traditional route through, in comparison to the, like you say, just throwing yourself in the mix and just having a go? Because to be fair, it seems like you're doing a pretty bloody job and just having a go <laughs> yeah I, I i touched upon i came from the fashion business i was a fashion model for many many years it was quite a successful one and so i've pretty much traveled the globe and i've lived in lots of different countries or i've visited lots of different places and i think one of the things it was never intentional but one of the things that i came away with was a an understanding of what makes a space work because I've sat on my own in countries wait, you know, waiting my turn for the shot or, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. And I've just been in an observational role watching this space works really well. Why? Why does it, why do I feel so comfortable here? Why do I, why have I reverted back to this place here as opposed to going across town there? And it, you just sort of pick it up, you know, it's just like this feeling. We all know that. We all do it. Every single person listening has that ability. They know where they feel safe and comfortable when they're sitting in the public realm. We all have this ability. I just happen to translate it into how can I have influence on it. Do you think that we've lost that connection to place, to people between humans and nature in the public realm, you know, the, the quality of our public realm? How do you feel about that? Yes, I think in certain neighbourhoods, definitely. And we know that there are some really well landscaped areas in urban mm. areas. And we also know that it just so happens to be in the more wealthy areas. So there are areas which are in desperate need of more landscape interventions for the public realm that aren't getting them. And actually, they're the ones that need the biophilic help that these these schemes offer because it tends to be there's more mental health issues more social issues yes absolutely it has lost its way and it tends to go to where the money is because those the corporates have the money and where the money isn't local councils there's not enough being spent there and there's too much onus on local communities doing it for themselves when they're busy trying to put food on their table mm. See, Mac, I, I think sometimes you do yourself a bit of a misservice because I think what's always amazed me about your work is actually the amount of science behind it. You know, starting off with the edibles and the impact that that can have on communities, going into the sort of the community engagement. And I think a prime example is probably your last two showings at Chelsea. And it'd be great to talk about those. The pharmacy of houseplants, looking at the health benefits of plants, but also your latest one, which was the botanical rhapsody, which is obviously looking into the effect of sound as well. It'd be great to sort of talk about those and the science of plants. Yeah, so RHS Chelsea from nowhere. I wasn't expecting ever to do a Chelsea garden, to be honest. I just didn't see myself as a Chelsea garden type. But then they come along and say, oh, we're going to do some houseplant studios and you'll be given this kind of, you know, studio made by whoever, Morven Garden Buildings. And then you can do what you want with it. I was like, really? What? what whatever I want? Really? <laughs> you really shouldn't say that to me. You didn't realize that. So again, <laughs> my attitude was this can't just be a pretty face because I'm sorry, RHS, but I do find Chelsea. It's all very like, oh, isn't this really pretty? Isn't this completely unrealistic? 
this is going to cost loads of money and it's not really plugging into the needs that are out there. So I immediately looked at, well, okay, if I'm going to do this, I want there to be a message behind it. So the Pharmacy of Houseplants, the first presentation we made in collaboration with Patch Plants, we're a brilliant partner actually, and we're totally, obviously understanding of the advantages of houseplants. So we, we looked at all of those levels, exactly the biophilic healing that you have. And that, so we presented the plants as the lotions and the potions that you would buy if you were going into a pharmacy. We deliberately called it the pharmacy and not apocryphy because we're not suggesting you eat any of these plants. That, <laughs> that wouldn't be such a good idea. But that they could help heal you in whatever method. We trialed a little bit of biosonification for that. Uh, but then we got invited back to Chelsea, suckers for punishment. And in this case, we created botanical rhapsody where the whole focus was on okay let's take that to the next level here about the biosonification so for those who haven't heard that expression before bio life sonification it's it's basically uh, putting sound to life forms so that can be a plant it could be a crystal it could be a bit of moss. I've seen people biosonify or heard, should I say, uh, uh, dry earth getting watered and what it sounds like when it receives that. Someone I'm working with can biosonify clouds. I mean, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> just, just, just to dive in on the biosonification. So we we're in a situation here. Biosonification. It's not just adding an extra sort of speaker into a situation understand it is it is it's it's the electrical signals and impulses within yeah. all living matter yeah. and and i think you've, you've you've described this to me in the past mark in such a phenomenal way around the every it, it, it it's different it's different with the same plant at different times it's different with the same kind of um engagement with, with different them. people touching the it, same plant it will respond differently i mean you'd think i my mind wouldn't get blown anymore but it just i can't still i'm getting my head around it so just to, to, to give you a very very abc headline description of what happens here we put um i have to i almost have to describe it physically when i do it so i'll do my best with the just giving you a verbal description. You stick electrodes on leaves. The electrodes pick up on the biorhythms that are happening within the plant. That information, which is a vast amount of information, that gets fed into the computer. Very, very, very clever program quantifies that information and corrals it into something that our rather limited human brains can work with because it's not so vast anymore. It's more sort of bookended if you like the information and then a very clever biosonification artist not myself may i add as the as joey joey dean who i worked with in chelsea will put it i give the plants fingers to play a synthesizer to quote him which is a beautiful way of putting it so in joey's case he will then make music with it uh and so his Thing, his genre techno go figure it's brilliant plants make great techno <laughs> you know i really wouldn't if you'd said that i would have said ah, reggae is more their thing i'm sure but you can apply it to anything so basically what you're hearing so in for instance with botanical rhapsody you'd walk into our studio at chelsea and you would hear a lovely sound in the room that had a sort of musical quality to it because I'd instructed Joey, I want the, says, how do you want the plants to sound? Because we could give them the sound of a banjo if we wanted to. So my brief was I mean, a lot longer, obviously, but roughly, I want them to sound like plants. And so we had to work out what that sounded like, like you're actually inside a plant and you were moving around in it and you're part of the biorhythm. And so, so poor Joey has to work back from my sort of well, what I want to hear. And then he gave me some samples. I was like, no, that's too scary. That's better. Can you imagine playing this to a three year old before bed and them not having nightmares was another thing I instructed him with. <laughs> you know? uh, 
and eventually you get the sound so you walked into the studio and there was this incredible lovely warm and welcoming sound and it was actually the four plants that we had attached to electrodes just doing their thing then you touch that plant with the electrode and the sound changes in real time whilst you're stood there and I'm stood there saying to you it's responding to you I encourage people to gently rub the leaves. We chose plants that could take a little bit of touch, obviously. So, for instance, um, uh, monsteras were great because they're quite strong in their leaf form. And then people would touch them. And what was amazing is the different sounds from different people. Sometimes the sound would come very sparkly and tinkly that came out of it. Others, it was more, you know, a sound. And sometimes wait for it of the plants in the studio all would go quiet with that person touching one of them go figure i don't know <laughs> it also happened at one stage when we had a clap of th thunder happen over the um it really the lightning really was very very close by and in that the moment of the thunderstorm the sound was so different in there it, it, I can't really, if I, I'll give it an emotional human uh, answer, but yeah. who knows, it was different. And then when that clap of thunder happened, everything went very silent for a while. And when they started back up again, it was kind of like, oh, hello, is it safe to come back out again? What, what's amazing here is, it, it, you know, this is just testament to the power of plants, but it's also a testament how much we just don't know at the moment isn't it you know that yeah. and this is why i think you guys are so disruptive and are such pioneers in this space because there's no one else i know that's 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 really trialing this stuff out getting it in front of people engaging communities in a conversation around plants but there's a whole biorhythm there that we interact with and that we engage with and it's absolutely be an area that just uh, just blows up i can't understand how it wouldn't it but needs to go in the public realm that yeah. is my aim. It needs to be out there. It needs to be far more accessible. Anyone, anywhere should be able to try this out for themselves and you see how they feel about it afterwards. Well, it's like you just throw me a perfect link there, Mark, because I was just about to say, you, you, not only did you create this garden for Chelsea, but it then went on to another location that couldn't be much more different from Chelsea, could it? Yeah. We took it to Glastonbury Festival. Awesome. I'm very fortunate in that I know the creative director of the field known as Shangri-La in Glastonbury Festival and many of the team involved in Shangri-La. They got wind, particularly obviously like the biosignification element, and invited me to bring the installation. And it just so happened the timing was really good, end of May for Chelsea, end of June for Glastonbury. So it was just shifted down there. Now, there it was far more open. We've got a very different demographic, much younger, uh, different economic backgrounds there, different cultural backgrounds. You know, Chelsea tends to be whiter, wealthier, but not exclusively, but that's to be more open, a different crowd. And we weren't too prescriptive there. We let people work it out themselves i spend a lot of time just watching people figuring it out and then just going wait wait hang on a second and then once a day there by a scientification artist would come at jerry dean would come along and do a live set with them at the end of the day a live techno set and it was incredibly popular and uh, people loved that and again we'd go around them explaining this is what's happening he's playing with that plant right now now admittedly he had a set program that he wanted to complete but the plants would always affect every performance so it's it be, worked well it did there's, yeah. there's going to be people googling biosonification joey <laughs> dean's set right now that's so as soon as they finish this podcast that's going to be the next playlist that they're listening to i think what's clear i think from all of this is your ability to collaborate and engagement can really drive positive action and i think that's something that maybe is your big differentiator because looking at these projects you have to bring together so many different people to be able to drive these outcomes do you think that's probably 
you know, the benefit of not being in the built environment who are notoriously difficult to collaborate with. We talk about collaboration all the time, Oliver, don't we? You know, in the need for it in the Absolutely. built environment. The environment talks about collaboration all the time and does not deliver. Sorry, guys. That's a headline. It's really? Really, you don't. Yes, I didn't know the rules, so I didn't know what they were. So I didn't know if I was breaking them. I just did it. So, yes, that helped. It takes years before a landscape architect can get accredited. More than a doctor. So, so where's the youthful energy? Where's, where's that spirit? You've battered the crap out of them by the time they've got there. Having to work <laughs> as a junior in a practice that squishes their creativity. So, yes, I didn't play by those rules because I didn't know them. Also, I have to say, though, Martin... Remember, the fashion business, a fashion shoot will have so many moving parts involved in it. And it changes per job. So I might work with one photographer in one studio, with one makeup artist, one hairdresser, stylist, da da da, da art director, yada yada, client, client, you know, country, you name it. So it just didn't occur to me that you go to lots of different um, kinds yeah. to make your thing happen uh, it well, just didn't occur to me because i've that's all i've ever seen is collaboration the one thing that really jumps out mark is that you've said it a few times now you slow down and you just observe what's going on around you and i've thought for a long time that if all architects were gardeners they'd be way better architects or maybe gardeners should just become architects because yeah. there's an appreciation for Everything from the outset of a project is an appreciation of orientation, of annual cycles, of weather, of the ebb and flow of, of how a site responds during the course of the year to different climatic conditions. Thinking about when you take a plant and where's the best place to orientate it and how does it sit well with others and all of those elements of gardening in a, in a slow and meaningful and ecological sort of systems sense to me, would just be so fundamental to introduce to architectural programs and clearly landscape architectural programs as well. But it but it isn't there, you know, and I think that's mm -hmm. the strength of the thing that you're saying here. And look, you've had all the juice squeezed out of you anyway, and you've probably taken on the bad habits of that incestuous yeah. I learned from the people before me in the same profession. Well, by it's 35, you've got a mortgage, you've got kids, you're less likely to take chances on your career. And those mm -hmm. choices is I'm actually making quite a fundamental point here. There's something very wrong with that because yeah. the creative spirit, as you well know, needs to be fed. Yeah. It's, it's quite that said, I do not in any way wish to sound like overly critical of landscape architecture because obviously it's a wonderful, amazing thing. And there are amazing landscape architects out there. Yeah. I think when studying as a landscape architect, I understand you don't study horticulture. There's no horticulture module there. So to me, it seems like the emphasis is on hard landscaping and not enough on the soft landscaping, which surely makes a huge portion of landscape architecture work. Yeah, I mean, there's, I really, I want to be careful to underline, I'm not criticizing landscape architecture as a profession. I'm just seeing that it, the way it's currently formatted isn't going to encourage enough really radical thinking. Yeah. And it really needs radical rethinking, especially in the urban realm. Yeah. Now, it's this common theme, Mac. Oliver, we spoke to Joe Giddens, didn't we, about the lack mm -hmm. of natural building products being taught within architectural schools. We're seeing it quite a lot. Just onto a new topic, we did quite a lot of work on the COVID Memorial Garden. And what I thought was quite interesting, I wouldn't mind your view on, is obviously in the times of lockdown, we've all come to maybe appreciate public space a bit more and greenery and that we cast our memories back, escaping the house for a walk or a run for that brief moment of time. Have you seen a step change in what communities now want from green spaces? Are we seeing that as a positive that's come out of lockdown and COVID? Communities always wanted it, Martin. Mm. Uh, where I'm seeing the change is where councils and corporate developments are getting it now yeah communities always wanted more green space i can tell you that because i got help 
just by putting 500 flyers through the door. The response was immediate. Yes, don't let that tree get cut down. No, we don't want more buildings there. Communities always want it. Always. They want better places for their children to play. They want their children to be able to play ball games. Bring those no ball game signs down. They're an aberration to me whenever I see no ball games. Something's very wrong with the management of that particular space if that's what you've had to do. So, yeah, so government bodies, local councils can't ignore it anymore. They can't ignore it. I don't know if you remember me having a conversation with you with my bugbear about the garden bridge where it's like, guys, the money you've assigned for the garden bridge, they're working on those 33 boroughs. You could have, let's see, and roughly about this amount being appointed per pocket park. I think we worked it out at roughly about 150, yeah. 260 at that stage. You could have 33 pocket parks per borough. 33 in 33 brothers. Mm. That is more important. So I know I've digressed a bit, but the problem is that the funding was immediately considered for a, you know, a jewel case kind of show off project like the garden bridge, which was neither a bridge or that much of a garden, to be honest, sorry. <laughs> Rubbish, the whole thing. And yet putting little pocket parks in really less than salubrious areas or areas that are desperate for some help, say in Tower Hamlets or wherever, Dagenham. Well, no, that's not considerable. No, 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 we can't do that. So, yeah, I th 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 there is always the call for it. And now, post-pandemic, the public purse is just shrunk, non-existent. So I'm very fortunate with the, the Blossom Garden is the garden that we took on during pandemic. I partnered with Davis White Landscape Architects and we won the tender to create this COVID memorial garden for the National Trust and the Mayor of London in the Queen Elizabeth Park. Now, that is an unusual space for me because it's an existing green space. And I realised it was the first time I'd ever done anything to an existing green space. I'd always started with grey, no good, nothing here. And I was tasked with well, well, existing green space. Uh, and one of the, funny enough, one of the caveats in the brief was to make it more accessible. So, of course, we had to put a path through it. So in this case, normally I green the grey, but in that, that case, I greyed the green a little bit <laughs> and I had to put a thwacking great big 100 metre path in there. But it, yeah, it's more accessible now. Amazing. Mac, you, we've got, I mean, we've travelled so far on this podcast today. We, we've gone from your sort of early experiences at disrupting to being able to implement some real societal change, I would say, with these pocket parks and in areas of need, like you say. What are your key takeaways or what are your key experiences really with working with communities? Because I think it's such a hot topic at the moment, and Martin alluded to it before, but yeah, what are the key things that we need to remember when working with these communities? Because that bit seems like the disconnect. That bit seems like when we're looking at public realm projects that aren't quite as good as they should be, mm. the missing link is always, have the community really been involved in this? Mm -hmm. And how do we get them more involved in it? And what's your, just let's talk a bit about your experience of working with communities and the good, the bad, how? So the how is a big question. And I'm afraid the answer is it depends. Because it does. Because each and every circumstance is individual. So, for instance, I'm working on a scheme at the moment, which is a private development in the heart of London, where I'll be working solely with their businesses and their residents. And we've already got feedback. That's why we've been brought in in the first place. They're not happy with what they've got. They want something else. So eventually I will start talking to them. Well, how much engagement do you want? Do you want to have, do you want to help plant? Uh, would you like to see edibles here? So the businesses maybe could harvest and use or, you know, or, for instance, mimic ingredients that you are using because harvesting from public realm, you, it, there's not enough. You know, it's more I refer to those sort of things as propaganda beds. They're about getting people to think about things. There are so many ways to engage 
with the local community I think the one thing is to be really careful not to be prescriptive and to think you know better and also to be prepared to take some flack I mean I in my neighborhood I'd you know I got to know a lot of my neighbors and I also learned that I don't like them all <laughs> I love some I love some others are a pain in the it's okay they're perfectly entitled to their opinions don't take it too personal yeah so it is a tricky situation and and I also I have to say to be fair there are organizations more and more now that specialize very have very specific ways of 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 engaging uh, yeah. local communities and for instance the, the 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 org that was used for the blossom garden was brilliant and they did poetry workshops, making thing workshops. So, because often a community don't know how to answer the question, what do you want here? That's not fair to ask a community that. They're not, they're not trained. So you have to figure out what the questions are that you're asking them and how you enable them to respond to them in a language that they can provide. So it's like, don't expect to ask architect or landscape architect questions because they can't give you the answers that you want to hear you need to learn their language i guess we always wrap these podcasts up with a question around what you'd like to see from the future and if we could be more slightly more prescriptive in the question sticking with the theme what would you like to see in the future of the creation of our public realm and the creation of our landscapes in our urban spaces it's a big one. It's the big one, isn't it? <laughs> it's the big one. I think, oh gosh, it's such a big one. I'll go back to the fact there's no more money in the public kitty. And so therefore we need more private money to go into the mm. public kitty. So with every private development, they must pay for a pocket park, at least mm. one nearby. Maybe that could be just the starter for 10. You don't get to do lovely gardens for your very wealthy residents and not provide something down the line because they've got to stop seeing it as a a sort of thing they have to do and they don't really want to do because actually it makes society better because it makes society healthier and healthier and happier people make healthier and happier neighbourhoods, which a private developer should actually welcome and want because it will make everything better. People spend more money. People are generally, you know, all around. To me, it's a no-brainer. So, but it does sound like sort of, it, I can imagine certain political persuasions being absolutely horrified by the suggestion. When nature is a healer and it is absolutely imperative for a regenerative future. Now, I think you've nailed it there, Mac. You know, thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, but we could have spoke to Mac for hours. Honestly, mate, my mind is still spinning from that conversation. <laughs> Has it inspired you to do more of your yard and your green wall? Oh, t- hey, listen, with some of the other fantastic people that have shown at your show before, I went straight out and bought their product and got it straight into my yard. I've got an amazing Jurassic jungle going on out there at the moment. I bet you have. I bet you have. But I think there's so many topics to pick up from that discussion i think a big one is around the training development that's going into landscape architecture and architects in particular absolutely and i think i said it in the discussion with mac but i've always really firmly believed that yeah someone like mac is perfect to shake up our professions because i think being a gardener or being an activist or being a blend of both is just an unbelievable way to prompt yourself to continuously challenge things challenge the status quo ask questions why we don't ask why enough why can't it be better why is it not like this why does it not achieve x and the other element is we mentioned it in there talking about how people who care for plants and gardens and i sound like a broken record on this but they understand climatic conditions they understand that humans are very much part of the ecology but they're not at the center of it in terms of try to create a sustainable healthy environment it's about giving much credence to nature and the natural habitats and the surrounding ecological systems as much as improving human life and improving people's lives so for me mac embodies that it's amazing and what mac really brings to the game is that ability to collaborate with people in the community 
And I think that really comes through in the things that she talks to us about. Absolutely. I, I think for me, it was the level of science that goes behind her projects. And that started with bringing edibles into the urban environment that you just don't see enough of. And then all the way through to biosonification as well. It was just mind blowing what's achievable. And also staying true to that aspect of theatre. Taking a project mm. from Chelsea to Glastonbury, I think just shows what's possible when you just think a little bit differently. Certainly wins hearts and minds in the way that she operates. And I know we're going to really look forward to having her on again. And she's blown my mind with the biosonification. I've gone down some pretty deep internet hole since our chat. I really look forward to seeing her at the show. Yep. So she's a judge on on our Lego competition that you're heading up a panel of illustrious judges, actually. Yeah. You've got Natasha, haven't you, from Low Carbon Materials? You've got yep. Sam over from Fermilon, so some previous guests. And you've got, got some great innovators. Activists. Yeah. Got some yeah, totally. as well, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, for anyone that hasn't seen this sort of socials content on this already, there's an amazing competition that's being run by the day in the Lego group called Build the Change. And it's about educating young people between the ages of eight and 13 on sustainability and on how to create sustainable environments, but by doing it through play and doing it through Lego, which was music to my ears because I've totally grown up loving Lego, still love Lego. And actually, we're going to get a chance to talk to some of these young creators at the show. It's been a privilege working with them, listening to them about their ideas and just just the ideas that unbridled imagination that by playing with Lego bricks can just bring different perspectives to how we solve problems. So for me, it was a total learning experience. And Mac is one of the key judges on that illustrious panel of innovators and disruptors that will be joining us at the show to award the winner to the Build the Change Challenge. And hopefully we'll be in the Fox afterwards, like last time. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be a crazy night in the Fox, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and we're keeping you busy that day. We've got you on another two judging panels. I believe we're doing our big innovation pitch. We're doing the big ideas pitch, which is with our startups. And also you're heading up quite an interesting conference session as well. Oh, Martin, I'm good. we'll drop a few little nuggets on the, on the conference session right now, but we're going to have to come back and revisit this one. It's called the 100-Year Plan. Uh, for a new world. And it's essentially focus on how do we eradicate short-term thinking within the built environment, but how do we also align all of the thinking of some of these really influential disruptors and innovators and pioneers who exist in different sectors, but who are all trying to address the same challenges and the same problems in with regards to the climate emergency and social injustice and biodiversity and habitat loss. How do we take their share, but how do we make it beyond their lifetime. And for me, some people say, well, what's the point in going further than that? What's the point in going to 100 years? The reason why we look to 100 years is because it has to be aspirational. There's things that we've talked to guys on the podcast about and Bill Dunster, I don't want to pay for energy in 100 years' time. In fact, I'll be morbidly upset if by some miracle I managed to make it to 100 years' time and I'm realizing that people are still paying for energy. So... There's an amazing timeline starting to develop with a load of guests and the panel is shaping up to be pretty unreal for that session at Future Build. But I reckon that we come back in a in one of our next episodes and when we talk to the guys a bit more about the 100-year plan. Absolutely. So we're going to do quite a lot of episodes in the run-up to the show. And actually, quite a big announcement is you'll probably be able to see us as well. So we're going to move on to a video and audio format, which is quite exciting. I'm on a diet, trying to get myself a video fit. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> That's all right. That's fine. <laughs> we're, we're out in the middle. We'll be fine. It'll be yeah. fine. So, you know, hopefully one of the next episodes of Future X will be give you the option to see us as well. Might be the last one, but we'll give it a go. So if you enjoyed today, please subscribe and share. Join our community to stay up to date with all things FutureX. Visit futurebuild.co.uk to sign up. Please also like them and share them to help grow our community. You can subscribe to the podcasts within your favourite podcast platform. Thanks so much for listening and we hope you'll be back again soon.